When Charlemagne came to power, he implemented two policies, expansion and conversion. So his reign was marked by almost constant warfare. And by 800, his kingdom included all of modern France, Belgium, Holland, Switzerland, almost all of Germany, and large areas of Italy and Spain. We've talked about many things that Charlemagne did economically and militarily, and it's important to remember that Charlemagne also did a great deal to encourage literacy and learning um, in his people. Most people during this time in Western Europe were illiterate. The center of learning was in the East, and in the West, people were too busy trying to survive to worry about art and learning. Even the monks who spent their days copying manuscripts often couldn't read what they were copying. The manuscripts of the 7th and 8th centuries were often confusing. <coughs> they, were <coughs> excuse me, they were all written in uppercase with no punctuation, and there were also many errors made in copying. A few monks, though, were educated, and Charlemagne wanted more to be, and his people to be. He felt that this was necessary for the Christianization of the kingdom. So he met and commissioned Alcuin of York, who we've talked about before, to devise the curriculum for his school that would be designed to train and educate monks and clergy. Later, this style of learning was replicated by the monks and clergy to the masses in monasteries and churches throughout the kingdom. As a result, by the ninth century, most monasteries had schools and scriptoriums. Here manuscripts were copied, but now they were studied and edited for mistakes. Copying was difficult, the lighting was poor, and the monk's hands were often cramped by the cold weather, and there was no standard scholarly language. But Charlemagne introduced a standard writing style. With all text being copied in all uppercase with no punctuation, Charlemagne introduced a new script, Carolingian middle, Minuscule, which had upper and lowercase letters, though all you see here are the lowercase ones, and punctuation, and the words were separated. This made the words and the script so much easier to read. Charlemagne also standardized the language. Much had changed in the, la in the language over the last 1,000 years with new words and phrases introduced into the culture. These were then incorporated into the language. So Charlemagne had the monks take account of these changes and include them in what became medieval Latin. One of the most important consequences of the increase in literacy and the connection between the church and learning was that Charlemagne was able to spread uniform religious practices and succeed in Christianizing his kingdom. Yes, some of that was done by force, but much should also be made of just how monastic life worked for that end as well. <clears throat> Monasticism was an integral part of Christianity, and there were many variations, but we will look particularly at Benedictine monasticism because this was the order of monasteries that Charlemagne imposed on his monks throughout his reign. The word monasticism is derived from the Greek word monos, which means alone. And the monastic life was defined by asceticism, which just means self-denial, and a solitary life. Benedictine monasticism that the Carolingian monasteries were fashioned after derived from a set of rules written by Benedict of Nursia in the 6th century. And Charlemagne had Alcuin, um, bring this rule to his kingdom and impose it on the monasteries there. Now, according to the rule of St. Benedict, 
and its prologue in 73 chapters, monks were to live in a community under the direction of an abbot to be trained in religious perfection. These monks took vows of poverty. They were to own nothing. Chastity, they were to have no sexual relations. Obedience, they were to obey the church and those in offices above them. And stability, meaning they couldn't wander around. They couldn't leave the monastery unless they were sent out for a particular reason by the abbot to do something. And the motto for these monks was pray and work. The majority of monks were men, but women also participated in monastic life, and this allowed them literacy. They were able to learn to read, and they wrote um, many books. And this was pretty much the only way a non-upper middle class woman could become educated. Now, um, Gregorian chant became the music of the monastery and the music of the church. In fact, Charlemagne made Gregorian chant obligatory in his church services. And Gregorian chant is monophonic. There's no harmony, in other words. And you have one or many voices singing the same line, with each syllable getting a note. And Gregorian chant is performed a cappella, or without musical accompaniment. And most chants belong to two liturgical rites. The Mass, which is based on Christ's Last Supper and Sacrifice, and the Office. And these were chanted daily and based primarily on the Psalms. Now, I want you to listen to a little bit of what Gregorian chant sounds like. Oh, but we can't. Sorry for the technical difficulty there. I will load that link on, into the course right after this PowerPoint presentation so you can just go in and listen to it on your own. I'm sorry, I don't know why that didn't work. Now, the visual arts. The main thing that these monks did in monasteries were illuminate manuscripts. This was part of their job. Um, there were no printing presses, so in order for there to be books, someone actually had to handwrite them. And I talked earlier in the presentation about how important it was um, in what Charlemagne did in establishing this new form of writing and to make these texts more easy to read. Now, this is an example of a illuminated manuscript. This is the Utrecht Psalter, and it was penned sometime around 820. And this is from the 150th Psalm, and that's what a Psalter is, just a Psalm. And this is considered a masterpiece of this period. It was made of parchment, which are just treated animal skins. And you can see here that there's the text of the psalm and then drawing, drawings around the text that show exactly what the text is speaking of. So they're just um, highlighting the text with pictures here, illuminating them, so to speak. And this is a psalm about praising the Lord. And so you get a variety of musical instruments that are mentioned in this psalm. The trumpet, the harp, cymbals, organ. You get people dancing. So it's just a pictorial representation of what's happening. This is the Day Golf Psalter. It's often called the Golden Psalter. And you can see how um, embellished this initial letter is here. And this occurs on the first, the 51st, and the 101st Psalm of the Daigle Psalter book. Now, this particular Psalter has ivory carvings as covers. So it's very, very decorative um, and obviously very expensive. 
Interestingly, many people believe this particular Psalter was written and created by a woman. We don't know for sure, but that is the scholarly um, supposition. Now, I want to show you a typical floor plan of a Carolingian monastery because lots of things went on in a monastery besides just monks living and worshiping and copying manuscripts. Um, many times the monastery in a small medieval town would be the source of um, medicine as well as education, um, beer, um, different things like that. Um, the place where people would go for meetings. So it was almost the center of the town, so to speak. Um, if you follow my arrow, this would have been the public entrance to the monastery. And you see the public would enter and go directly into um, the monastery church. Now, um, this is a hostel where they would have housed guests that, you know, pilgrims perhaps or not very important people. Um, the house for distinguished guests would have been right here. This is a school where people would come to learn, obviously. The abbot, or the head of the monastery, had his own house, and it was here. There were several kitchens located throughout the monastery. This is one, um, this is one, this is one. Um, down here as well. Um, this would have been a house for pilgrims, perhaps. Um, this is another kitchen, and this is the refectory, the main dining hall where the monks would have eaten. So lots and lots going on in the monastery. Um, they would have had cows and the cow herds, um, the swine and the swine keepers, um, goats and the goat herds, um, sheep and the shepherds all down in here this would have been the livestock area where the livestock and those who took care of the livestock um, would live um, this is a bakery and a brewery as well um, making beer was an important occupation for the monks this was the physician's house the herb garden because most of their medicine came from natural remedies and they still believed in bloodletting in the Middle Ages. This was the main cure-all for diseases they didn't know how to cure. They would cut you and bleed you and hope as your body reproduced blood that it would be better and purer. Um, there was an infirmary, <clears throat> um, a vegetable garden, I mean all kinds of different things. Um, they even had their own cemetery. Um, Craftsmen and artisans here, a granary. So as you can see from this plan, that these monasteries were very well self-contained. But they also had functions in the community at large as well. A monastery like this one would probably house about 120 monks and about 170 other workers. So the monastic life was pretty significant, and it was a pretty good gig if you could get it, and if you could deal with poverty, chastity, and obedience, um, the monastic life might be for you, because unlike other people in the Middle Ages, you could guarantee that you would get fed every day, 